<laughs> At this time, I'll call our uh, August Board of Commissioners meeting to order and would like to inform you that three of our commissioners are not here tonight. Uh, John Rebolts is having surgery in Raleigh, had that this morning. Uh, and uh, Stan is out of town and Commissioner Richardson is under the weather. So we do have enough to uh, have business, so we will continue. Uh, this, I started to jump ahead. Uh, this time we'll have our invocation by Commissioner Langley and our pledge by Commissioner Walker. Please stand. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful that you have allowed us to come together one more time to do the business of this county. God, we ask you for your peace and that you will grant us the sincerity to do what is right and pleasing in thy sight for the furtherance and the growth of this community and this county. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please, please fly, fly I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'll ask that uh, if you have your cell phone with you, please turn it off or at least put it in vibrate mode. Uh, item number C, conflict of interest. Does any of the commissioners have any conflicts with any agenda item? Hearing none, uh, we're down to the approval of the agenda. Entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. And a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, items for presentation. The first one is the service award presentation. Uh, Dolores. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. We have one Beaufort County employee tonight I'd like to recognize for their county service. Um, he could not be here tonight. But Mr. Philip Balcom with our water department now has 15 years of service. That's great. Thank Espre you. Express our thanks. Absolutely. To Thank him. you. The next uh, item for presentation is the uh, Youth Voice Summit presentation. Uh, Ms. Emily Bowen. Good evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm not Emily Bowen, or uh, Bowen, I'm Chastity Woodkovich. I'm the 4-H agent here in Beaufort County. I've been here a little over three years, and I work with Rod Gerganis. I think you all know him pretty well. Um, so were any of you involved in 4-H growing up? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'd like to start with that before I give a whole spiel about 4-H when people know what I'm talking about. But um, for you, um, it is a youth development organization for youth ages 5 to 18. And it is all about giving youth hands-on experiences to kind of help them find their spark and kind of explore passions that they have. Um, on a local level, my most well-known event is our livestock show that happens in the spring each year. Um, I'm currently doing summer fun day camps. And then back in June, I actually went to an event on the statewide level with a teenager. Um, it's called Citizenship Focus. And it's all about citizenship and um, getting youth involved in events that... Um, kind of impact their local government. So we met with legislators and coming up in a couple of weeks I have Emily Bowen go into Youth Voice. So I'll stop there and let her come up tell you a little bit more about her and the conference. Hey, good evening commissioners. My name is Emily Bowen. I'm a recent graduate from the Beaufort County Early College High School program where I graduated with both my associate in arts and science. This upcoming fall I will be attending East Carolina University double majoring in political science and business. Throughout my years, I have been involved with 4-H through various things, varying from cooking camps when I was younger to volunteering this past summer with the summer fun day camps that Ms. Chastity just mentioned. Um, through these summer fun day camps, youths were able to learn about the little creatures that live in the woods to creating and maintaining their own garden. Not only that, but I will also be attending the Youth Voice Convention, which will be taking place in Concord of August 12th through 13th. 
There it is associated with the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners where I hope to be able to learn more about our local government and legislation. Who of you all will be attending that? Well, okay, great. <laughs> um, that Saturday morning they will be having a breakfast where I'll be sitting at the Beaufort County table and I hope to get, get to know y'all a little bit better and learn more about our local government. Thank you for your time and I hope to see y'all all again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Emily, and uh, we look forward to having breakfast with you. Sounds good. <laughs> the uh, next item is Child Support Awareness Month. Uh, Tammy. Good afternoon. I'm Tammy Pearson. I'm the North Carolina Manager of Operations for Young Williams and the county contracts for the child support services through our company. I brought along today Tina Jordan. She's our new project manager over the Beaufort County office. And a little bit about her, she's been doing child support over 15 years. And she met the majority of her continuous quality improvement goals that the state set for her this year. She missed one by 0.28 of a percent. So, and that was collections, and the whole state was down on total collections. But today we're here to talk about a proclamation. I had submitted it to each of you and I wanted to read it at this time. So whereas Beaufort County is recognizing August as Child Support Awareness Month and reaffirms its commitment to strengthening Beaufort County's families by providing child support services to improve the economic stability and well-being of children. And whereas in state fiscal year 2021-2022, more than 4.1 million in child support was collected from parents of Beaufort County's children. And whereas there are nearly 2,577 child support orders in place working to ensure that more than 2,672 children receive financial support from their parents. And whereas the court must order either parent to obtain and maintain health insurance coverage for a child if it is actually and currently available to that parent at a reasonable cost. Whereas Child Support Awareness Month salutes the diligent working parents who spend time with their children and who make regular child support payments to safeguard their children's future. And whereas children, whereas strengthening individuals and families promotes the safety and well-being of children, provides stability, improves their lives of children, and provides opportunities for families to be able to enhance their children's futures. And whereas children who do not receive adequate financial and emotional support from their parents may experience greater difficulty in becoming healthy, happy, and productive citizens. And whereas may concerned and many concerned and dedicated judges, district attorneys, clerks of courts, sheriff's personnel, and child support professionals work to establish and enforce child support orders for both for county child children and one of our county's most vital resources. Now, therefore, we, the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners, we hope you do, hereby proclaim August 2022 as Child Support Awareness Month in Beaufort County and commend its observance to all citizens. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what you do. Right, thank you. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to uh, support the pro proclamation that was just read. A second. A motion and a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you very Thank much. You. The next item is uh, public comments and Dawn. Hello, my name is Dawn Brinson Slan. I'm a resident of Beaufort County, a small business owner, and a taxpayer. I understand from dear friends that like to keep me in the loop that I was personally attacked for standing up to provide factual information regarding the presentation from the agricultural extension agent during the budget sessions and the justification requested to provide for a new tractor. While one would think that as a public citizen and no longer a candidate in the current election cycle, I could use a three-minute comment period without being called names, apparently that's not the case. It seems that a local, small, online publication is utilized by certain members of this board, both under their real names and several aliases, to lash out at the members of this board that do not agree with them on their positions, and now apparently to those of us that provide public comments in these meetings. That seems a bit one-sided since the public is limited to three minutes. 
In the item sent to me most recently, I believe I'm classified as a socialist, along with others that believe in the spirit of working together with all members of this county to reach the common goal of growth and prosperity. And my support of the farmers is considered supporting special interest groups. I can assure you that the farmers in Beaufort County are way more than a special interest group. They are very important to the growth of Beaufort County. And if they are referencing the seed companies, then they don't understand the program. Realizing we live in a constitutional republic and the free speech is one of the rights we hold so dear, I'm absolutely fine with whatever names are given to me as long as the assigners of those names are clear that I do not intend to keep highlight that I do intend to keep highlighting the truth and ensuring inconsistencies in the assignments of labels is brought to the forefront for the people of Beaufort County. While various groups that receive funds from the county budget are asked to defend their salaries and costs over and over again, I'll be highlighting the value of the taxpayers' dollars at work spent on those elected individuals solely focused on their special interests, their salaries and benefits. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I don't see either one of our representatives here. Katie. Okay. Uh, the next item is our consent agenda. I would like to pull one. Uh, for our next month's meeting, and that's the ABC Board Appointments. Uh, is there any other items that anyone wants to pull? Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve the other 11 items. Motion to approve. Second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of the consent agenda, raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, Dan, the item number I, item for decision, is from our health department, uh, and I'll turn that over to you, uh, GM. Sorry. <coughs> Commissioners, hope you all are all doing well. Let me first introduce uh, Claire Harris. She is the president of the Behavioral Health Task Force, or one of the co-chairs, mm -hmm. and Tiffany is uh, the program coordinator for the Behavioral Health Task Force and she works out of the health department's uh, office. <clears throat> so I'm here to talk briefly about the opioid settlement agreement and to open conversation regarding the Behavioral Health Task Force's recommendations for what they feel is impactful and feasible plan to help our ca uh, county uh, reduce opioid misuse and prevent uh, accidental death from overdose. So I thought of uh, bringing you some graphs to show you the impact on our county, but I've, I know y'all have all seen graphs in the past showing how bad the opioid problem is in our community, so I didn't want to bring all that, but y'all are aware of that problem. So uh, <clears throat> Beaufort County will be receiving a total of $3,077,680 over the next 18 years, and this is the way it's uh, distributed over those 18 years. So at first I thought, well, that sounds like a lot of money, but when you break it down over the amount of time we're talking about, uh, you, you realize that it's not a lot for a big project or big cost uh, project. So to be clear, though, it is better than nothing, and we feel like we can make good use of these funds, and uh, that's, so that's where we are trying to move forward with it. We have received the first payment of $118,243. Uh, recently, and according to the schedule, we will be receiving $260,000 uh, sometime before the end of the summer, is what they're saying, so next couple of months. So going back to the graph, you can see that we're going to be receiving uh, about $250,000 per year for the first few years until 2025. Starting in 2026, uh, the uh, allotment will go down to between one hundred thirty-five and one hundred eighty thousand a year. So uh, when Beaufort County signed the MOA with the state, we agreed to follow one of two options. Option A is a very short list of 12 objects or 12 uh, strategies on there. And uh, we could have gone with that. Uh, then there's option B, which is much more robust in strategies that are allowable. Uh, but what it does entail is that we have to have a collaborative effort in order to use uh, option B. So last August, I mentioned to you that it was my hope to go with option B to allow more strategies and to get to get our community involved, which was a very important part of that. So behind me, you see some of the Behavioral Health Task Force members and the community members that were all involved in trying to come up with these recommendations for you. 
Uh, I went into more detail about this uh, plan in the January board retreat. Uh, so I wanted to put the behavior of task force into context as to why uh, I made that recommendation for option B. So the BC360 came into being when the race to the top committee transformed in 2014 to take on health and human services and we created that group and they came up with three task force and you can see that behavior health was one of those task force and that was in 2015. Uh, and then, so the group has been meeting since 2015 and they have been uh, putting together a strategy for the county as far back as 2015. As a matter of fact, it's pretty robust, very robust strategic plan that they came up with and they have been actually working on it. Uh, you may not have known this but Using that plan, uh, many of the clinics have brought in counseling, many have brought in uh, medicated assistant therapies, behavioral health uh, 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 clinics, and um, uh, naloxone distribution. So some of those strategies that we've already been putting in place came before uh, the, this settlement was even known to be coming about. And as a matter of fact, some of those strategies are the ones that are in, are in option A. So we've already actually adopted some of those without using the opioid settlement funds. Because they were together for so long, um, the KB Reynolds decided that they would like to support us and they gave us $800,000 over three years. So this is, we're now starting the second year. And we've been using that to support working towards and implementing, implementing the strategic plan for opioids. They gave us funds to build up the BC360 data platform, which is through the ECU. Uh, is a platform with data that we use. Uh, to look at the problem and then we're supposed to be using that now for looking at how the impact of the strategies that we implement are doing in our community. They also gave us funds to look at community engagement process and what we've did with that is we have really built up our community health work and outreach programs um, and that program is, is really kicking off and doing really wonderful things and we want to utilize that outreach effort to help us with the strategic plan for the settlement of the or using the funds here. Most relevant to today though is we use the funds to train the Behavioral Health Task Force members and the community members on results-based accountability and they use that to discuss opioid issue and come to other recommendations that we're going to present. And as mentioned previously, the funds are also used to help not just planning but with the implementation of these strategies as we move forward. So with that I'm going to turn it over I think to uh, Tiffany. Okay, over the past year, the Behavioral Health Task Force has worked diligently to revise our strategic plan to coincide with the MOA for the opioid settlement funds. We've actively sought input from both community members and community stakeholders regarding the needs of Beaufort County residents. We held three public engagement events where we solicited input from both stakeholders, community members, treatment providers, anyone who has been um, affected by substance use or opioid use disorder. And all of the different agencies and organizations you see on the screen actively participated in determining the strategic recommendations that we're bringing to you today. The mission of the Behavioral Health Task Force is to identify and respond to the behavioral health needs of Beaufort County based on evidence-based practices and collaborative action. While our first priority is to focus on Beaufort County, we have worked very hard to reach across the county lines so that we can start to continue to focus on building a, a regional effort. Um, our comprehensive prevention campaign begins with, with collaboration to prevent substance misuse, but it also includes strategies for interventions for those who are transitioning between um, treatment and recovery. Um, based on the input that we've received from all of our community partners, we have determined these strategic recommendations um, to use the opioid settlement funds to maintain the Behavioral Health Task Force collaboration add peer support specialists and one health education specialist to our community and we also wanted to further our efforts by um, um, piloting projects that may not be addressed in the other um, strategies and Claire the co-chair is going to actually give you more details about that. Good evening commissioners. Um, 
The first thing is, is to maintain the Behavioral Health Task Force. That is a voluntary task force. Um, and in order to help maintain that, we're asking for, um, to contract for a position to help coordinate those services. We all, on the task force, um, almost all of us work full-time jobs and this is in addition to it. So to help support that, the community engagements as you heard Mr. Madsen talk about, and also public information campaigns. Um, the second strategy we would like to present tonight is about peer support specialists. Peer support specialists are actually individuals with lived experiences and in this case, um, that are in substance use recovery. They're able to um, be trained, be able to engage in evidence-based treatments, um, care navigation, wraparound services, also with some re-entry to support reconnection to resources, and also to ensure that there's a continuum of care. Um, and peer support specialists are those have a unique niche in supporting individuals that are that are struggling with substances since they've had that their struggle their own struggle they're able to make some connections that sometimes clinical or administrative people are not able to with them the um, next option that we're looking at and are requesting is a health education specialist um, and that person will be planning implementing and evaluating substance misuse prevention and interventions to our county, um, working on our public education campaigns, engaging the priority populations. We're looking at our youth and adolescents, pregnant women, and parents and family members, and parents, families with um, individuals that have substance use. We know that for health education specialists, research tells us that our return on investment is anywhere from four to one, all the way up to $12, $12 for every dollar spent. Um, so certainly evidence-based, certainly um, understanding that we're getting more than we're providing into it with there. And the final project that we're looking at this evening, um, we know that our communities and our community members have wonderful intentions and ability to to make a difference right there where they are in their home communities, their little niches of Beaufort County. So we're looking to offer up a chance to pilot programs with yearly evaluations that coincide with the opiate settlement, the MOA. The objective is so that we can increase the capacity of our population um, and serve those people who oftentimes aren't reached. We know we have lots of resources in, in the town of Washington. We know when we go to Bellhaven, Aurora, Chakawinity even, resources dwindle. So trying to make sure that we have access and community members have access to some projects throughout the county. Um, we're looking at, we're asking for $10,000 of funding per pilot project per year with a three-year funding proposal. Um, we will ask for measurable um, matrices for tangible outcome measures and also how those projects will be sustainable following that initial um, assistance with the opiate settlement money. Um, the target populations we'll also be looking at for community pilot projects are those that we've identified with the BC Data 360 data. Um, a great amount of energy has gone into really fine-tuning the way to understand how very small numbers really impact our communities. Um, you know, on the big scale, Beaufort County percentages across the state may look very small, but we know that we still have hot pockets, so we've really worked with ECU trying to fine-tune where some of those are in, in different populations that we're missing. Any, any questions, uh, oh. Jerry? Um, this is not necessarily opioid related, but homelessness. Definitely. Um, do you have a number, an idea of how many people are homeless in Beaufort County? Well, we do the uh, annual count, mm -hmm. and that usually comes out with a number of 20. But then you have some that are considered homeless who are they go from house to house kind of homelessness, so that's also there. And we know that 20 is undercounted because we're not able to find them all. 
Well, my, my reason for asking the question is, is the state of North Carolina says that Beaufort County does not have a homelessness problem because money is given to Pitt County for the region and they identified Beaufort County as not having any homeless people. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask this question. How can I, or if you can, provide me with a list of homeless people so that I can show them that there are actually homeless people here? I have some names, but I know that uh, the list can be a lot larger. So. Well, as you saw earlier, we do have a behavioral task force that has been looking at homelessness in the county, and they actually were a big part of the opening of the uh, Open Doors um, was it? Community Center. Community yeah. Center, Open Doors Community Center. So we do have some connections with um, that group. So uh, I'll go back to them and try to find out if there's some data they can give you to help with that. I mean, the, the quicker you can get that to me, the quicker I can do something with it okay. and, and the reason I'm, I'm asking is because there's a grant available for Beaufort County for homelessness and so I just need the names so that I can turn them into the people who asked me for the names and we can move forward. Well, I'll, I'll get back with you before the end of the week with something. Okay. And um, just to wrap this up as far as the settlement money, this is financially what we're looking at per year. Of, um, is around two hundred forty thousand dollars. So that's that's within the first five years, and it makes me want to make, point out to, that this collaboration is not just looking at opioid settlement money. That's just part of it. So we want to use that money to springboard into some bigger ideas, because uh, I, as I mentioned, we've already been doing some things. We know there are some bigger projects that we can do. Um, for an example, I pulled up here um, earlier today a funding opportunity for $1 million to come to a locations that have collaborations that are looking at opioid settlement or not opioid issues. So I think our task force having seven years of history and having worked on this uh, strategic plan and having presented to y'all this that we are a collaboration validates it enough that we can we be a good candidate for this, this kind of money that's out there. There's other groups that have offered to match the um, county dollars if they can show that we have a plan. So I think we've got th that to show that. So this is just a springboard. This is just a part of the whole picture. That collaboration has expectations of, of changing these strategies over time because you know, we could have been a county that said, okay, well, let's do syringe exchange program and let's do um, MAT. We could have just said that. We could have done that for 18 years. But we feel like we need to continuously look at what the problem is and continuously to mold based off of some of those strategies. Like the little projects we're talking about, uh, which is only $10,000 per year is all we're looking to do that. But maybe there's an organization out there, and I'll give an example, say the Boys and Girls Club. Maybe there's a program that they can bring to the Boys and Girls Club, well then maybe we can help support that. So that's just one example. Um, there's other organizations that have a little bit of, of mission that really would line up with this well. And we feel like we should try to show them support, see if it works. If it works, good. We can apply for more money, try to get more money into that program. So that's where we're trying to move forward with this. Could Mr. Booth? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. In your presentation, I thought I heard you say something about hiring three people. Well, we're going to contract. Okay. Yeah. And 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 you only get anywhere people. From four people. Mm -hmm. You only get anywhere from 100, 160 to two hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So from opioid money. Mm -hmm. So our money is gone yes. for employment. Where is the help for the people that need it? That's what I need to see. Well, you think that these. First off, there's a lot of the help that's there, but the peer support people will help navigate them through that system and get them to the help that's needed. It, but, but for 18 years, these people are going to be here for, are they going to be here for 18 years? No, sir. We're looking yes. at a three-year project. Pilot program. Project, and then to as, as we progress through those three years yearly, continue to evaluate how we're doing and where, where do we head next? Right? Because um, 
and as more funding comes down, just like Mr. Langley said, you know, that was one of the things we addressed was homelessness. But at $3 million, and as large as that sounds, doesn't really make a dent in having to figure out homelessness. But if we can tie future funding into the collaboration of those members, um, then that does allow us. And so we need someone dedicated to help coordinate that. Um, we know that additional prevention, um, certainly lots of activities for the person who is currently using to make a change needs to happen. But we also know we have to change the next generation. If we don't work to make a shift early on, then long walk. In 18 years, we're still at the same problem. What were we doing before this, this drug settlement? What were we doing? Well, I mean, we brought medicated assistant therapy mm -hmm. into the jail system. We've had medicated assistant therapy at some of the clinics. We've had uh, syringe exchange programming going on. But what were we doing on, on Everyday Avenue? People in jail, we got them. What were we doing on Everyday Avenue that people that needed help? And just like Commissioner Langley just stated it, 20, 20 people in Beaufort County, homeless. Everybody in here know the more homeless people in Beaufort County than 20. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at community health workers, which is already huge in our county and has integrated in so many different localities in our county, those projects um, building up those services so that that person in somebody's home and community understands what they're looking at, recognizes there's a need that maybe they're tr that it's not obvious. What do we consider them. homeless? I'm sorry, sir. What do we consider homeless? Well, we're not prepared, I think, to talk a lot about yeah. homeless. Well, that's what tonight. we need to talk about because that's part of this. It's going to be it's tied to this money, isn't it? No. No. Okay. So you okay? I mean, I, there, oftentimes a user becomes homeless. So I mean, there is a lot of. No, we, over that. Well, we ain't gonna talk about them because we we here to talk no, about them. Like, yeah. But as far as users go, we think we have things in place for. We have a lot of things that are in place that they don't even know how to get to right now. So that's one thing we want to prevent people from starting to get into that. That's but why the health educator is an important part. The navigators are there to help users. A navigator is a reformed user, and so they're familiar with the circle of users. So they're, in, in part, there to try to help get them into what services are already provided. They're there to, um, to help counsel. They're there to meet with them when you know, they're, uh, they end up going into jail or if they end up going, getting arrested or they end up going to the emergency room. The navigator or the peer support people go there to meet with them and try to help to get them. So that's what they're offering. They're helping to navigate the systems that's already in place. And they provide the continuum care of care that is needed for people who are actively in treatment, but after five o'clock, the clinic is set, is shut down. So therefore, in the after hours, when they're in crisis mode or when they're thinking about relapsing, you have those peer support specialists who can actually speak with them, not in a clinical sense, but is a lived experience person, and bridge that gap between treatment and care. And I, I also add that our community engagement included people that or have used or lived the experience of addiction. So their, their, their input was brought into this conversation from that point of view. Commissioner Walker. What physical building will you be working out of? In other words, if some, somebody's having a bad day, where do they go? Well, it, yeah. With the peer support specialist? And that specifically? Like yeah, well, anybody level? that's having a, you know, a bad situation, do you have a building that they can go to and say, help me? Actually, It'll be a phone call. Uh, it, yeah, that, uh, that peer support specialist can actually take that phone call, triage in essence, determine do they need to go out or not, um, and to actually meet them where they are. Um, so it does not, peer support is not like housed in a typical office because that is where we recognize people often don't engage very well to get started. <laughs> you know? I'm inclined to give the contract for the peer support to Clearpoint because they have, they have licensed addiction specialists and, and counselors who have been focusing on this since they've opened up three years ago or something like that. Anthony uh, Tyree is a big part of that. So I'm inclined to try to put this, support people with him 
mostly because that way they'll be available 24 hours through their hotline number. So they go to the patient? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, for the most part. And if this person needs medical care, they end up in maybe the hospital? Or it depends on the level of care that we're talking about. We have, uh, we have appointments that, uh, through the hospital system, which you uh, use here. We have appointments at the health department. Uh, Agape has appointments. And there's other offices like Clearpoint that they have, uh, Dream and Port, who are all part of this. They're all resources that are available to these people. So there'll be no need to build a, a physical building with this money? Yeah, and that was part of, we realize it seems like almost small because the problem is so large, but we needed to be able to present and manage projects that are actually doable um, with what we have and not accounting for every last penny thinking, you know, what happens when there's a hiccup? Inflation happens, right? So we, we really took that as a group, and during those meetings, there was a lot of conversations over making it doable, making it meaningful for Beaufort County um, with what we have and the resources we have currently. Right, we and looked at the feasibility and the immediate need right now that we actually have enough funding to try to um, work towards keeping in mind that you know we can continue to seek out grants match funds things like that for bigger options that we have such as an inpatient treatment facility which has been voiced to me ever since I've been on the task force um, affordable housing transitional housing things like that we've taken into consideration but the problem is right now three million dollars over 18 years is not sufficient to do it's that and I even calculated if we went every county east of us and every county north of us we wouldn't even have a million dollars a year between all of those counties. We, we'd we hit a million dollars a year if we can get Craven, Carteret, and Pitt, but that's if we can get all those counties involved. Are, are you asking us to turn over the the management of the $3 million for 18 years? or uh, I, mean, I don't think we have to do it all at one time. I think that we're saying let us go forward with these strategies. Let us use that money. To, to do these particular projects since it adds up to close to that same amount. If we don't use that money, it stays in a coffer, right? It's not year to year, so mm -hmm. it, it's fenced in and it just stays there for, again, if we reassess this every year, every two years, you know, we may be here two years from now, three years from now saying, hey, we now have this grant, we could use that money to do this, and it might be different. But right now we just need, uh, I guess, the, the blessing to use this money to move forward with these steps right now. Proposals for the first three years. We're going to use the Data 360 team to assess the impacts that these um, strategies has on the opioid epidemic in Beaufort County. And at the end of that three-year period, if we don't see the results that we're looking for, then we can regroup and consider some of the options that we've also discussed in the task force. Well, I, I'm in favor of making some kind of a commitment for a three-year period, but I want to. I want to see the data at the end of three years. We don't want to make a commitment for 18 years if we're not making any progress at all. Right. Yeah. Being at the first three years. And the KB Reynolds grant that $800,000 that is already going towards this effort, because out of those three options, the first one is already being paid by KB Reynolds. So we only have to put that money in for a couple of years. So that's actually money that we don't have to commit right away. So their requirement is is that we have that data platform in place. So we've been working on it. Uh, hopefully within you know a certain amount of time it'll be on the health department's website with all the data that's immigrated in from unusual sources. Uh, usual sources like the state's there, but then there's other stuff you know that could be brought in as long because we're partners in this. Well, what I'm going to recommend unless the commissioners uh, disagree with this <coughs> is we have three commissioners that are not here tonight, so I would prefer we not take any action and that uh, we postpone making the decision until our next meeting. Uh, when we got, you know, word, it, it, it was a little bit late to cancel your presentation. Did, did the other commissioners in agreement with that, Lori? Yeah, okay. Well, I appreciate I have one final question. Yes. Sir. yes. So, but basically, what you're saying to me, and I, and correct me if I'm wrong, is 
that you're going to somewhat have a local mobile crisis for substance abuse. I think so. I think those peer navigators are going to are going to help fill that role. Okay. It's 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 kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, where you have people that have gone through that to help sponsor people through the program. But it's a, it's a much broader than that. But. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Well, we thank you very much for your uh, for your time and what you've done up to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Item number J uh, is the approval of the Sheriff's Office, uh, North Carolina Department of Public Service grant purchase. Um, Chief Rose. Good evening. Um, I was reading over the information that has been presented as far as the booklet to you, and it's, it's really, you know, the information there is, it is what we're talking about. Um, in essence, the scanner is it's not going to replace but it's going to supplement and and offset for crime scene sketches uh, with a lot more um, clarity with a lot more um, a lot more accurate and it's going to help paint a picture better for especially for juries in major crime cases um, whether it be you know homicides um, uh, sex offenses or things like that that we would have a designated crime scene um, it's something that we have been that we've tried to figure out how to purchase through the budget process over the last handful of years uh, something that stays on the one or two priorities for use of drug asset forfeiture money um, but then with the grant and some of drug asset forfeiture to supplement that then we felt that it was the right time for us to move forward with this purchase so um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of the commissioners have. Yes. You, you, that's just your grant funding, is that correct? It, this is going to be, um, if, you're, if you remember back from several months ago, uh, we did receive a grant. We've that's already right. made a couple of purchases oh, out of that. The uh, drone was one of them. The drone, the and UTV the and trailer. The money. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Motion to approve. Oh, yep, second. second. Okay. But I have one question. Yes. Is this like a, the scanner? You it. Correct. Goes in yeah. the room and it's, it's, images. Yes, everything? It's, it's a very. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very nice piece of equipment. Uh, surveyors use it. Contractors use it. You know, to to duplicate to make renderings, two D and three D renderings, and it's something that can really that's something that can really paint a picture. Um, as far as time savings, right now investigators are still going through and actually using, um, you know, handheld devices for measurement, um, which are not as accurate as a laser rendering is going to be. And you know, quite frankly, in 2022, if you are having a jury trial, juries expect to see some of the technology that they're seeing, you know, on television and things like that. And if you go in with a, you know, even a computer render drawing using smart draw or something like that, then they're, they're expecting a little bit more than that. But it, it's a very impressive piece of equipment. How fast does it scan a room? And Now, that I don't know. Okay. That, that, that I'm not sure. Is that it? Okay. Any more discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you, Charlie. You're very well. Uh, the next items are from our Public Works Department, and the first one is Swan Point Waterline. Christina. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Look this way. Um, during the July Board of Commissioners meeting, there was a discussion regarding the waterline expansion project at Swan Point. Bids were received, which resulted in an estimated 79,000 project budget shortfall. At that time, the Board of Commissioners was unwilling to commit additional funds to complete the project and instructed staff to contact the landowner to see if they would be willing to fund the additional shortfall in order for the project to proceed. I'd like to report to you this evening that I have received a check uh, from the uh, Robert Whitley Jr. Family Trust Fund in the full amount of $79,513. Uh, based on the receipt of these funds, I would uh, like to request the same 
things I requested last month uh, that the Board of Commissioners approve awarding the construction contract for the installation at Swan Point uh, for the the and the installation of the new water line extension at Swan Point for a value of $229,122.50. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Thank you. I do have some questions. Um, the, um, I've been told that there was a lesser price PVC alternative why would that be considered? Schedule 40, uh, it's the thickness of the wall and the pressure that it's rated for. Because some of, how, how many other projects like this have we uh, adopted in where they've had an existing water system and, and we've that was done before I worked with the county, but I, my understanding, I think the emails that you all received with that information, I think uh, there were two uh, two or three uh, water lines or areas, subdivisions, or mobile home parks that had water line installed. Well, certainly I appreciate Mr. Willis doing this, and anything we can do to lessen his cost, that I'd be interested in uh, pursuing. If at all possible, could it be switched to the lower price? No, sir. The Schedule 40, that's not per uh, the uh, Water Department's standard specification. You want to uh, go into the uh, windows or replacement? Uh, actually, repairs. I'd like to say one more thing about the Swan Point. Uh, okay. Next month on the uh, consent agenda, there will be a formal budget amendment. But again, we couldn't prepare that until. But based upon your uh, vote tonight, we'll put that on the consent agenda for next month. Okay. Yes. That amendment is just to show that you got to check the 79. Yes, sir. To, to show getting receiving the funds and moving it from one fund to another fund. Yes, sir. Just the accounting process for the auditors, the purpose of the auditors. How, how, how soon will this work start? Uh, I will be contact. Actually, I contacted McDavid and Associates and told them that the plan tonight was to ask for approval to award. So McDavid and Associates will be contacting here in Ravenbark tomorrow in order to start the process with the submittals and check on the availability of material. So we're looking to get it done as quickly as we can. You good? Okay. And as far as the uh, window project, uh, Wes Overman will be presenting that this evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening, Wes. Thank you. Um, so on uh, June 17th, we issued a request for proposals um, seeking bids for window <coughs> replacement and canopy repairs and construction on the courthouse annex building. Um, this, this was emailed directly to three local contractors advertised on our website as well as some other venues. Um, no bids were received for that uh, posting. Um, we issued a second request on July 8th, and a copy of the RFP, or partial copy of the RFP was uh, attached, I believe, in the agenda packet. Um, the, uh, the scope of the contract includes replacing 25 windows, repairing two existing canopies over entry doors, as well as constructing a new canopy over a second floor entry door to the um, district attorney space. Um, Public Works staff received a certificate of appropriateness from the, for the project from the City of Washington on April 5th. Um, on July 15th, we received one bid from A.R. Chesson Construction Company uh, for a lump sum price of $126,360. That amount does include an allowance of $2,000, which hopefully will not have to be used for um, potential framing repairs when the windows are removed in case there's any water damage or anything. Um, hopefully won't have to be used what we put that there just in case. Um, funding for this project was uh, partially approved in uh, the fiscal year 2022 capital improvements budget uh, with a previous estimate of $80,500. Um, based on the requirements from the City of Washington Historic Preservation Commission, um, we have had to use uh, clad wood windows instead of going with some cheaper options. Um, so that has caused the initial estimate to increase. 
Um, however, we are anticipating no additional funds would be required for this project based on some savings for some other projects that are currently ongoing or in the planning process. Um, if, you, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those about the RFP or um, anything, anything that you've got. You say you sent out the bids to three contractors. Yes. Who and then, and why was these three just picked out? It's just three we were familiar with um, that we thought would be proper to, that could handle the job. Who done the last job? Um, that was Braddy. Yeah, Braddy Construction replaced a few windows. Okay. Um, that was one that received the information. There was no communication back from them. Okay. It was also posted on the county's website, and uh, I, I, I the purchasing agent posted a, the, what's the state website? The state IPF. Okay. So it was posted I, I, in numerous. I understand. Places. I was. Just, I just wanted to know why we just sent it to three people. That's, I, but he told me. Uh, Wes. Yes, sir. When you when you look at the. Uh, paperwork that we've got in here, like on the front of that building that you're looking at from uh, 2nd Street, there's four windows up top that are not circled. Have they been replaced before? Yes, there are several windows on the building that have been replaced recently. Okay. Um, it is kind of a, a mismatched building as far as our uh, windows go, so hopefully this project is also going to help make the building look more proper. So what's been done previous plus this will replace all of the windows in that annex is that what you see circled is what's to be replaced the ones that have been previously replaced within the past 10 10 years is that roughly will, will not be okay. replaced okay what will the canopies be made from uh the canopy is if you're familiar with the courthouse annex building there's two over the rear doors um the one that will be constructed on the second floor we have I uh, told the um, Historic Commission that it will be constructed as similarly as possible to the two that are on the first floor. They're similar to 4x4 four four wood framing. Um, they'll both be, they'll all three have some metal roofing on top of them, um, but we're going to match appearances best we can. Anyone else have any questions or comments? All right. I uh, got a motion. Uh, second. I'll second. Uh, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, one question yes, before you leave. I drove by the solid waste at Yatesville. Yes, sir. Some people call it Beckwith, and it looks like it's ready to open. We are very close. I anticipate it being open sometime this week. Sometime this week. Yes. So we're not going to have a ribbon cut. We're just going to open it up, right? And certainly, if you want to, we'll be glad, no, to, we'll think, be glad to stretch the ribbon. I think the best thing is just open it up. <laughs> But we're very close. Um, the project has gone um, as good as we could have expected um, based on what we were dealing with there. So haven't run into any major hiccups. That's been great. And um, it's, just, it's gone smoothly and we're ready to get it open too. So. Well, my friends at breakfast will be glad to know I, when I tell them tomorrow. It's not surprised. This week. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no, I would prefer just to stay out of it. You just opened it up. We will certainly do that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're down to the finance uh, department. Anita, you're going to give us a report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, real quick, just give you the most recent sales tax numbers that came in today for the May sales. Um, they came in at one million sixty-four thousand, and that's up sixty-four thousand dollars from this time last year, same month last year, or six point four percent. And we are trending at a surplus of about one point three million dollars for sales tax for fiscal year twenty-one twenty-two. Remember, we still have one month to go on that. Did take a quick look at the calculation I did for the additional payment to the schools, um, since that was based on an estimate a couple months back and now that we have actual sales tax numbers that have come in the last several months that numbers within five dollars of what I told you I thought it would be so that's all I have with us just being one month in the new fiscal year we'll tell you the auditors were here 
um, for a few days a couple weeks ago. Um, that went really smoothly. They'll be back in uh, late August to wrap up the audit so we could try to get our report in by the October deadline. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Dan, to the manager's reports, uh, the first one is the Beaufort Promise Guidelines. Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, on, as you'll recall, at a previous meeting, there was a request from the board to look at the Beaufort Promise Scholarship Program guidelines with the county contributing funding to that. There were some questions about the guidelines. If you'll find in your agenda book on page 153 through 154, Dr. Luke, the president of the community college, uh, sent these guidelines over that outlines how the Beaufort Promise Scholarship Program is put together. And I'll call your attention specifically to page 154, item number six. It reads, in order to receive funding from Beaufort County through funds allocated for subsidizing the Beaufort Promise Scholarship, students must be United States citizens and must prove residency in Beaufort County through one of the means detailed in number five above. And that talks about things like driver's license, um, uh, other, other ways that would prove a bill that shows that they live in that, at that particular area. Uh, students can provide residency uh, in students who can provide residency in Beaufort County, but not U.S. citizenship may still qualify for the Beaufort Promise Scholarship through private funds provided by the college's foundation. And the college will track all funds from Beaufort County separately from all other funds used to support Beaufort Promise and will not use Beaufort County funds to support any student not meeting the requirements of these guidelines. So essentially what they're saying is they put in all the stipulations that were requested by the board, but they're also allowing any student that, that is looking to have a scholarship, they have private funds that will help them if they need that. So um, wanted to have that for, for the board's review um, and, and any comments. Did we need to take uh, action, Brian? So I, I don't know whether the board necessarily needs to take any action. I think your request was that these items be included. Um, the community college is the one that's handling the program. I think they've met all of your requirements. Uh, you know, I, 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 unless you have an issue with this, I would I would say that you're okay with just saying we we see it. That's what we wanted. We're fine. Move forward. Um, Everyone fine. Everybody? Okay. It's the best we can get, but I mean, I mean, I'm a, I support what they're doing, but I don't think you ought, any child that, that want to go to college ought to be able to go it, that lives in Beaufort County. I mean, it, it, and to me, it, it kind of disturbs me the folk that didn't even vote for it get, put, get in there what they want. But I'm going to still support it because it's the best we can get. But I would put any child that lives in Beaufort County is eligible for this money. And I mean, that's what, I mean, they pay taxes and everything, but so, but is this the best we can do? I'm, I'm pleased with it. So, Commissioner Booth, I think the community college supports that same um, that same thought, yeah. and that's why in their guidelines they've established opportunities yeah. through the foundation and through other private funds to ensure that anyone in Beaufort County who wants to be able to attend school and that's the reason I'm going. So. that's the reason I'm going to support it is but I, I still think, I still stand by what I said. <laughs> I, I understand. I think they, they recognize that as well, and they, and they support that, and they want to make sure as well. But they also want to make sure that they've met the requirement from the, from the Board of Commissioners because they want to have those funds to help additional people be able to get an education. Uh, the next item. Brian, are you going to do that or uh, David? Well, I'm kind of going to hand it off. Um, I, I, my name got attached to it, but it's really the county attorney's. And really, I'm not sure. Well, the county attorney's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. He's going He's going to take this, and I'm going to pass it off. I've even got some hands up. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. Sorry. Uh, the problem I have tonight is that the the main complainer about this that want us to review the situation. And it, it does need reviewing, and I, I have reviewed it. He's not here tonight, uh, and we have two others that aren't here. I don't want to go through this twice. Right. Uh, okay. And I just suggest uh, I am ready to go, but I, I suggest we hit this at the next meeting. All right. Let's put it on there. Have, I have no problem. I think uh, otherwise you might have to do it again. 
Second. Well, that's right. Let's do it one time. Agree. You need a motion to no, take no, it? No. Okay. Uh, the next the next item is mine. Uh, let me get to that page, 158. Uh, as many of you know, Mr. Billy Mayo was associated with the county for a number of years. I can't recall right offhand how many years he was actually the attorney for the county. 30 years was 30 years. 30 years plus. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, when I was around him one day in the old courthouse, we were walking downstairs and finally got outside and he looked over at the new courthouse. He said the new courthouse and this was just a few years ago. Uh, he says, and he looked back at the one we just came out of and he said, you know, we used to have all of our government in that one building and look at what we've got there. But uh, heck of a nice guy and I think uh, touched a lot of lives in Bedford County, not only in government, but doing personal uh, legal work for a lot of uh, a lot of people they are in the process of doing a portrait uh, the bar association has made a contribution of 2,000 and there's private donations of 2,100 and I'm going to make a recommendation uh, that we uh, contribute 2,900 which will bring it up to the total cost of $7,000 uh, and as I understand, I think that'll be hung in the Buffett County Courthouse. So that's my recommendation. So moved. I, okay, and a second. But I, I have a question. Yes. I'm doing the math. Yes. It says $7,000, correct? Yes. $2,000 uh, from the bar, private contributions of 2100 Yes. And it also says Will has made a contribution. Was he included in the uh, private contribution, or does he have a contribution? I think uh, no. I think his contribution is in involved in the other two uh, that's already on there. Okay. So. I just wanted to know. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, the items for discussion that Commissioner Richardson had. Uh, I'll read those. The sales tax money for the schools, which we talked about last time. Combating illegal drugs in Bedford County, which we talked about last time. Uh, the Sheriff Coleman's office hours. Uh, jail inmate supervision discussion. So all of that will be tabled until next meeting. Um, does any commissioner want their two minutes for comments? If, if not, I'll enter... I've got a motion to adjourn. A second? Second. And a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand.